Hi, Pastor Blair here, and I'm so glad that you've tuned in to use this resource, and we hope and pray that it's a blessing for you. We also pray that you would use this resource in conjunction with and participation in your local church. Discipleship was never meant to be done in isolation, and this resource was never meant to replace your participation and involvement in your local church. The local church is where we grow, and we grow as disciples of Jesus, and we see the forward progress of the gospel in our lives. Now, if this resource has been helpful for you, would you consider giving back to help us continue to make resources and continue to develop the quality of our resources? You can give financially at compassregina.com. And most importantly, we just treasure and covet your prayers. Well, I want you to consider this statement, okay, as we begin this morning. Um, it's this statement by Daryl Miller. It says this, If the church fails to disciple the nation, the nation will disciple the church. If the church fails to disciple the nation, the nation will disciple the church. Someone is always actively impacting culture. And if it isn't the followers of Jesus, it will be by default, those who adhere to a different worldview, a non-biblical worldview. So think of this on a smaller scale when it comes to your own kids. If you are not dis- discipling your kids, someone else will. And someone else, that someone else might likely be, uh, whether it's a person or an institution, it will most likely be someone that doesn't hold to a biblical worldview. So the stakes couldn't be higher. Now, a biblical worldview, as we've talked about so much in this series, is, is about navigating through a biblical lens in every area of life, in every sphere of society, what it means to be a Christ follower and displaying that to the world through the way that we live our lives. Because Jesus is king of heaven and earth, and we need to remember that truth and act like it and have the courage required to stand in the face of a prevailing cultural worldview that is contrary to the biblical worldview. It's only biblical truth that leads to flourishing and freedom, and not just for the church, but for Christians and non-Christians alike. Now, last week we talked about that that there's there's worldviews, there's a crossroads of worldviews, isn't there? And you see that progressively more and more in our culture. And there's two ways leading to very different cultures. One way is the way of forgiveness and love. And the other is the way of grievance and victimhood. So one's forgiveness and love. It's a biblical worldview, the way that we approach the world through a biblical lens. And the one, uh, uh, one a culture that leads to victimhood and grievance is an ideological social justice worldview. Now, what kind of culture do you want to live in? What kind of culture do you want to create? And I think about this this week. I thought to myself, well, I want to live in a culture where truth, justice, and love are the highest pursuits. I want to live in a culture where God is honored as king, and all people, regardless of their race, their sex, their class, are respected and loved as God's loved children made in the image of God. That's the kind of culture that I want to live in. I want to live in a culture where people are judged not by the content of their character, or by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin. A culture in which justice is based on God's unchanging moral law and those accused of injustice are treated with fairness and impartiality. So I want to live in a culture that upholds due process in the rule of law, a country that sees all people as fallen sinners, yet objects of God's love, His mercy, His forgiveness. A culture marked by grace and mercy and forgiveness, a a culture where reconciliation and redemption are possible. A culture marked by humble gratitude, a culture marked by forgiveness and love. Now, the problem with forgiveness is that it's really easy to talk about and it's really hard to do. It's really hard to do. The reality of forgiveness is that it really hits home when you are in a position where you need to forgive. Now, at the core of the Christian faith and the biblical worldview lies the doctrine of forgiveness, 
and yet it's so often and widely misunderstood as a biblical doctrine. So I want to talk about that this morning and challenge you in this area of your life. And we're going to do that by looking at Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Now this is a parable, so it's a story. And Jesus often told stories, and the stories are, are meant to be told. They're, they're a story that has a lesson, or they're a teachable story. We, so, you, know, you might think of it like an illustration. It's an illustration to prove a point, to tell a story, to teach us something. And this is what Jesus is doing in this particular parable. It's called the parable of the unforgiving servant. All right, so this is what it says in Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Right, reasonable question. And as many, as many as seven times, he says, and Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. Right, so now he's telling this this story is helping him to understand what he meant by saying 70 times 7. So there's a, the, king, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now it's, a, it's, it's money, talents. We don't use that anymore. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment was to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Wow, that's, that's pretty kind. It goes on, verse 28. When that same servant, after he'd just been forgiven of his debt, when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him money. And he owed him a hundred denarii, which is uh, a, denar a denarius was a day's wage. And seizing him, he began to choke him. Nice guy, huh? He begins to choke him saying, pay me what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I have had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all of his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So Jesus is teaching us something here. And it's important to understand this story when you understand what a talent and a denarii is. So a de de denarius was a, was a, a money, um, and, and it was a, a one, denarius, one denarii was a day's wage, okay? So a talent, a talent is 6,000 denarii. So a, a denarii, a denarius is one day. A talent is 6,000 denarii, or it's, it's basically 20 years of work, 20 years of work. So think of what happens here. If a denarii is one day of work, and he owes him 100 denarii, but then you go up and you see in, the, in verse 24 that, that he began to settle. One was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents is 200 thousand years of labor. It's impossible. It's impossible. It's, it's $3.48 billion today. See, the point of this story is that we don't understand how much God has forgiven us. The point is that the forgiveness of God is without limit. And we're to forgive much because we have been forgiven much. See, the point is, this man was never, in a million lifetimes, would never be able to pay back this kind of money. And yet he goes out from this, this gracious and merciful act by the, the king to him, and he, and he goes to a fellow servant, and he says, you owe me. It's like saying, you forgive me of my, ten, of my million dollar debt, but I won't forgive you of the ten dollars you owe me. 
You know, forgiveness is one of the most difficult things in our lives. It's one of the most difficult things to do. But listen, the gospel that works in us always works through us. It shows its power in our relationships and our actions. And one key way that this happens is when we forgive others biblically. We tell a better story to a watching world when Jesus' followers forgive others in a biblical way. It's a better story. Forgiveness is something that, that God is consistently working on in my own life. And it's incredibly difficult. I, th- I think you can relate. It's very hard. Forgiveness really is the, uh, the real F word. Because it's so flippin' difficult to do. Right? Now, as hard as it is, forgiveness is essential. It's essential. It's modeled, it's taught by Jesus, not only in this passage of Matthew 18, but all throughout Scripture you see this. The nature of forgiveness. So let me give you a definition of forgiveness. It's not my definition. It's a 300-year-old definition by Thomas Watson. And he said this, when he was responding to uh, Jesus' teaching, where where Jesus in the Lord's Prayer said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And he responds with this, we forgive others when we strive against all thoughts of revenge, when we will not do our enemies mischief, but wish well to them, grieve at their calamities, pray for them, seek reconciliation with them, and show ourselves ready on all occasions to relieve them. Now, when I read this definition, I feel a great amount of despair. I mean, it, it, there's, there's this, this despair in my soul because of the harsh reality of how hard it is to forgive others and how hard it is to do that outside of the power of the Holy Spirit that's working inside of us as Christ followers. But it's a very biblical definition of forgiveness, and each one comes from Scripture. So, the first one, resist thoughts of revenge, Romans 12, 19. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I've seen this in my own life. You, you, you know that, that the truth eventually comes out and people that have wronged you or whatever, and, and vengeance really is God's. And, and it really is true. And Vengeance doesn't always look like what we might want it to look like, like a really bad car accident. But God always has vengeance. It's his. He says, don't seek to do them mischief. 1 Thessalonians 5.15. See that no one repays another with evil for evil. Or wish well to them. Luke 6.28. Bless those who curse you. Ugh. Ugh. That doesn't taste good, does it? Bless those who curse you. Grieve at their calamities. Proverbs 24, 17. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. And do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Pray for them. Matthew 5, 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Or seek reconciliation with them. Romans 12, 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. So as far as you are able... And as far as depends on you, you are to make every effort to, uh, to make peace with people. Be always willing to come to their relief. Exodus 23, 4. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey wandering away, you shall surely return it to him rather than kicking it in the butt. So it will go further away. Now, so here's forgiveness. When, when you feel that someone is your enemy or when you just simply feel that you or someone you care about has been wronged, forgiveness means this. Resisting revenge, not returning evil for evil, wishing them well, grieving at their calamities. Oh, man. How many times have I wished ill for someone that's hurt me? Praying for their welfare, seeking reconciliation as far as it depends on you and coming to their aid in distress. Now, all this points to a forgiving heart. And the heart is so important. And when the Bible talks about the heart, it's not talking about the organ that pumps. In the Bible, the heart is referred to as the very core of your being. And in Matthew 18, 35, unless you forgive your brother from your heart, so from the very core of who you are, you must forgive your brother, your sister, your friend. 
whatever it may be. But, but you don't know how much this person hurt me. But you don't know what this person did. You don't know the reasons. You don't know the pain that they've caused me. But, 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 but. You see, it doesn't matter what comes after but. You, f- you can fill in the blank. All that matters is that it stops you from forgiving. Whether it's forgiving yourself or forgiving others. And oftentimes, the hardest thing in our lives is not necessarily to forgive others. The hardest thing in our lives is to forgive ourselves. We've done something, we've made choices, we have consequences, and it's super hard to forgive ourselves. Now, it's important for us to understand what forgiveness is, but it's important for us to understand what forgiveness is not. Notice what is not in the definition from Thomas Watson. It says this, for the first thing that's not in there is, the first one is this, forgiveness is not the absence of anger at sin. It's not feeling good about what was bad. It's not, it's not turning a blind eye. It's not accepting what is bad or evil in the name of being forgiving. Secondly, forgiveness is not the absence of serious consequences for sin. In other words, sending a person to jail does not mean you're unforgiving to them. So you think of a marriage, if you're in a marriage, you know, when you when your heart's posture is to go to your your wife, for example, and, and ask for forgiveness because you just want things to go back to the way they are, they were, well that's may not necessarily what happens. I mean, sometimes that's the posture of our heart. I I'll say whatever it takes just to get things to the, back to the way they were. You know, the Bible sees there's evidence throughout Scripture that, that forgiveness is, is, uh, is not the absence of serious consequences for sin. You see this in the life of David. But let me, look, let me just show you in the book of, of Hebrews. And in the book of Hebrews, on one hand, it teaches that, that Christians are forgiven for their sins. But on the other hand, it teaches that our Heavenly Father disciplines us, sometimes severely. Now, when I'm talking about the book of Hebrews and the book of, you know, Matthew and the, the, the Bible's the Bible's a library of books, sixty six books. So that's 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 what the Bible consists of. So and the bookends of this library is the book of Genesis, and the end is Revelation. And then you have these sixty six books in the in the Word of God that make up the Bible. So in the book of Hebrews, particular book in the Bible in the New Testament, in Hebrews eight twelve it says, "I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more." You will forgive. But then in Hebrews 12, 6 and 10, it says, Those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Our earthly fathers disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But, but he, God, disciplines us for our good, that we might share in his holiness. So our sins are forgiven, and our sins are forgotten, in the sense that they no longer bring down the wrath of a judge, but not in the sense that they, they, don't, uh, they no longer bring down the painful discipline of a father. Right? Sin, sin has consequences. Right? When, you're, when your child is young and the stove is on, you say, don't touch the stove, there's consequences, and then they touch the stove, right? That there's consequences for that. No matter what you say, they still got a burn mark on their hand. There's consequences to sin. Thirdly, one last observation is this, that forgiveness of, of an unrepentant person doesn't look the same as forgiveness of a repentant person. In fact, I'm not sure that, it, that, that in the Bible the term forgiveness is ever applied to an unrepentant person. Jesus said in Luke 17, 3-4, Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. So there's a sense in which full forgiveness is really only possible in response to repentance. So full forgiveness is only responsible in response to, for, to repentance. But even when a person doesn't repent, we're called in Scripture in Matthew 18 and Luke 6, we're commanded to love our enemies, we're commanded to pray for those who persecute us and, and pray that there's good that comes to those that hate us. But the difference is, is that when... When a person is wronged, 
who doesn't repent of, of their, their turning from their sin, they're repenting, they're acknowledging what they did wrong. There's a sense where full uh, forgiveness can't take place because, because there's no restoration there. Forgiveness is meant to bring about restoration and a, a restored relationship, reconciliation that happens. So we can still... We can still lay down our ill will towards that person. We may even be able to hand over our anger to God. We may seek to do the person good, but we can't carry through the whole uh, process of forgiveness and reconciliation or, or return to in sort of intimacy and relationship. So full forgiveness is, is only possible in response to repentance. So we talked about, uh, earlier I talked about uh, you, you do as much as you're, as you're able to make peace with others. You can only do so much when it comes to uh, forgiveness in a relationship. So think of the, the um, Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. The, uh, when they built it, of course, you know, lot, they do this a lot. They build bridges. They start from one side, and they start from the other, and they meet in the middle. Well, it, when they meet in the middle, that's when the cars can travel across the bridge. But, but sometimes, you know, it, you, you can do everything that you can, and if someone's not willing to sort of meet you there in, in repentance, then you can't have that kind of reconciliation that's, that's really needed in the full picture of forgiveness. So you do as much as you are able to do. You know, there's something that happens in forgiveness that is so, uh, so amazing. There's a, a weight that's lifted off your shoulders. I don't know if you've experienced this where you have like some ill will towards someone or something happened and there's a broken relationship and you go to that person and you know you, you, you have some beef with them and then, then you, you make it right. There's forgiveness that happens and you make it right. There's like a weight that's lifted. You know when you fight with your parents uh, and there's, you know, and then you make it right? Oh man, that's nice, you know? We've told this story before. Uh, years ago, uh, my wife, Sharon, uh, she found hair in our house, cut hair. Okay, so naturally when your kids are little, you want to know, hey, who's cutting hair, right? <laughs> so she asks, amazingly, no one in our home cut the hair. It just, it was a miraculous event. The hair ended up in our home on the floor, just amazing. And nobody, nobody fessed up. Nobody said, hey, yeah, I cut hair, I cut my own hair, whatever. We didn't know, couldn't really tell. Well, years later, years later, one of our kids came to, uh, to share in tears, repenting, because they had carried that weight on their shoulders that whole time, knowing that they had knowingly lied about cutting the hair. And the weight that was lifted from, from that child the weight that was lifted, just this, they were in tears. And it's just like, oh, it's just like so refreshing, right? The weight is taken off my shoulders. Thomas Watson said something like this. He said, it's something kind of jolting, actually. He said, we're not bound to trust an enemy, but we are bound to forgive him. Ugh. So you can actually look someone in the face and say, I forgive you, but I don't trust you. I forgive you, but I don't trust you. A, a person's heart posture is so important. Now, what would make this an unforgiving thing to say is if you were, if you were thinking this, I forgive you, but I don't trust you. What's more, I don't care about ever trusting you again, and I won't accept any of your efforts to try to establish trust again. In fact, I hope nobody ever trusts you again, and I don't care about your, if your life is totally ruined. That, that's not a forgiving spirit. Now, if we hold fast to an unforgiving spirit, we will not be forgiven by God. Heaven is the dwelling place of forgiven people. And when we hold fast to an unforgiving spirit, it proves we don't trust Jesus. And if we because if we trust him, we will not ignore his way of life. If we trust him, we will not be able to take forgiveness from his hand for our million dollar debt and withhold it from our ten dollar debtor. Paul said in Ephesians, another book of the Bible, Ephesians 4, 32, forgive each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you. In other words, God's forgiveness is the foundation and it creates and it supports the forgiveness that we 
give to other people. Our forgiveness sits securely upon the forgiveness of God the Father to us. So if we don't give it to others, and we go on with an unforgiving spirit, what we show is that God is not in our lives and we aren't trusting him. And I'll tell you what, we're not showing a better story. A watching world needs to see a better story. It needs to see a better story in the followers of Jesus, not an ideological social justice story of grievance, of victimhood, of unforgiveness. A watching world needs to see a better story of forgiveness and love. In our home, we've been, uh, each night we've been watching or reading a, a chapter out of um, the book, uh, Hiding Place, and it's the story of Corrie ten Boom. I don't know if you know or are familiar with, with her, but she was a Dutch Christian, and along with her family during World War II, they helped many Jews escape the, the Nazi ge- ge- genocide, and eventually they, they saved a lot of Jewish people. They hid them in their homes. They, had fake, they built a fake wall in their home, and amazing story if you ever get a chance to read it. But eventually they were caught, and Corrie and, and their family were all sent to prison, to prison. And her sister Betsy and her dad Casper died in German custody. So Corey survived, and she later tells this story, this gripping story of encountering this Nazi officer in the, in the prison where her sister Betsy died. So this is after the war, and she encounters this officer, this one who, who uh, was a guard over her and her sister in the same prison where Betsy died. Listen to what she says. It was in a church in Munich that I saw him, a balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filling out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland to defeat Germany with the message that God forgives. And that's when I saw him, working his way forward against the others. One moment, I saw the overcoat and the brown hat. The next, a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. He came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. And this man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me. His hand thrust out. A fine message, Fräulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. It was the first time since my release that I had been face-to-face with one of my captors, and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. No, he didn't remember me. But since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fräulein. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? And stood there, I whose sins had every day to be forgiven and, and could not. Betsy had died in that place. Could, could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out. But to me, it seemed like hours. And I wrestled with the most def- difficult thing that I had ever had to do. And still I stood there with coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is is not an emotion. I, I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. 
Jesus, help me. I prayed silently. I, I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into that stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder. It raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands. And then his, this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, with all my heart. Wow. That supernatural love and forgiveness demonstrated by Corey Ten Boom is a true revolution. It's a better story. The revolution of Jesus Christ. And we're amazed when we hear stories like this, aren't we? It just seems like these people possess this power to forgive their enemies of unspeakable things. That power came in part from a, recogni- from a recognition that, that they too are sinners, that we too are sinners, forgiven by God and object, objects of his amazing, extraordinary grace. Right? Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. It's getting what we don't deserve. See, rather than seeking vengeance, they entrusted ultimate judgment into God's hands. So should we. These kinds of stories are only possible in in cultures that have been deeply shaped by a better transforming story. The truth of a biblical worldview. It's powerful. It's deeply beautiful. It's good. It's true. The gospel that works in us always works through us. It shows the power in our relationships and our actions. And one of the ways that this does this happens in our lives is when we forgive others biblically. We've seen that the gospel really takes root in us and, and it begins to work itself out through us. The trajectory of truth is our minds, our hearts, and our hands. Forgiveness is one of those areas in our lives that, where the gospel must go to work. It must go to work. Forgiving others really isn't possible in our lives if, if, we're li- if we're not living in light of God's forgiveness towards us. We forgive because we've been forgiven much. So the gospel moves us towards forgiveness. And the gospel begins with God's movement towards us. It takes, God takes this initiative that he is the offended party and, and he acts to reconcile relationship while we were his enemies, it says in Romans 5. Our sins separate us from God. And he had every right to condemn us. He had every right to resist us. He had every right to sever the relationship. But he didn't. Instead, he moved towards us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8. Is that registering with you? Do you see that God owes us nothing, but he gave us everything through his son? See, reconciliation with God requires our repentance. By forgiving our sin, God extends the power of reconciliation. But reconciliation is not complete until we repent and receive his forgiveness by faith. Notice how both of these dynamics are played out in 2 Corinthians 5, 19 to 20. God is reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Scripture gives all credit and all glory and all praise to God for our salvation. Because it's only by his gracious initiative that we're, we are able to respond. But, but our response of repentance and faith is essential. Salvation is not universal. Only those who repent and receive God's gracious offer will be reconciled to him. So we might summarize God's forgiveness this way. By moving toward us, God invites and enables us to move toward him. 
The gospel starts with God, the offended party, moving towards us, the offenders. He cancels our debt and opens to us an opportunity for reconciliation. If we acknowledge our sin and repent, we're reconciled to God and we're, ex- we're able to experience the joy and the delight of relationship with him. So our forgiveness of others is intended to mirror the forgiveness God has given us. It's a better story. It's a better story to the world. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you, Ephesians 4, 32. It's a better story. Scripture assumes that if we have truly experienced God's forgiveness in the gospel, we will be radically forgiving towards others. The gospel doesn't just show us how to forgive. The gospel empowers us to forgive. And like God, we take the initiative to move towards those who have offended us, and we invite them to move towards us in repentance. How easy is it to look at the hurts that others have caused us, and you might find yourself struggling to tell that better story, that story of forgiveness But when we say, I just can't forgive that person for what he did to me, you're essentially saying, that person's sin is greater than mine. That that person's debt is greater than mine. But when we embrace a gospel perspective on our sin, we recognize that sin, that that the sin debt that God has forgiven on our behalf is greater than, than any sin that has ever been committed against you or me. And as we grow in our awareness of God's holiness, we begin to see more clearly the distance between his perfection and our imperfection. As the significance of Jesus' work on the cross grows in our consciousness, our willingness and ability to seek restoration of others will also grow. After all, if God forgave the massive offense of our sin against him, How could we not forgive the sins of others against us? And it may be severe, and your inclination might be, but you don't know, you don't know, you don't know. But whatever it is that happened to you or that somebody did to you, it pales in comparison with our own guilt before a holy and righteous God. You know, forgiveness is costly. It's costly. It means canceling a debt when we feel we have every right to demand payment. It means absorbing the pain, the hurt, the shame, and the grief of someone that sinned against us. It means longing for repentance and restoration. But this is exactly how God has acted towards us in Christ Jesus. And through the gospel, the Holy Spirit empowers us to be able to do the same to others. So let me ask you a couple questions to think about. How does one's unwillingness to forgive make us victims? How does a victim mentality affect our ability to respond to circumstances where forgiveness needs to happen? See, unforgiveness, friends, it's like drinking poison and hoping that someone else will die. That's what unforgiveness does. Let's let's show the world a better story. We have a better story. One of forgiveness and love. And one of the stories that we remember every week of the reality of the forgiveness and love given to us is when we take communion together. The Lord's Supper, it's sometimes called, or Eucharist in some settings. And this, the Lord's Supper is not just for anybody. The Lord's Supper is, is, is for Christians, it's for Christ followers, it's for those who acknowledge that God came to us and he reconciled us to God as we repented of our sin and our brokenness. And, the, and the, the, the Lord's Supper takes place when Jesus is with his disciples and they're in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast and he's sitting with his disciples and he takes the wine and he, and he says, this is my blood poured out for you. And he takes the bread and he breaks it and he says, this is my body that will be broken for you. Now remember, this is, this is a, a uh, confusing thing for the disciples. They don't really understand what Jesus is talking about. And within hours, Jesus is arrested. He's held on a sham trial, and he's eventually nailed to the cross. Mm -hmm.
And the disciples realize in a kind of like amazing way that's his body broken for us. His, his, his blood poured out for us that we can be reconciled to God. It's a better story. It's one of forgiveness and love, grace. His body was broken for the forgiveness of our sins. So let's take our communion cups and the little wafer, this sort of COVID way of doing this, and let's partake together to the King. You know, there's nothing um, magical about uh, these cups. There's nothing magical about them. But they're deeply symbolic and they're deeply meaningful. And what they, what they mean to us is we remember. And, and Jesus says we are to remember. So we remember every time we take communion or the Lord's Supper, we remember what he did for us. His body broken, his blood poured out for us. Let me pray, and then we're going to continue to worship through song. And you feel free to stand or sit. The, the point of, of worship is not because there's some kind of show. And I know in this setting, you're in a theater, and it feels like a show because we're just by nature of that. It's about focusing on the words, and it's about understanding who we are in light of who God is. So if you leave today after we sing these songs, and you, there's a few things that you remember, or maybe you make a few notes about some things that you didn't know, uh, it's good. It's a good way to worship. And if you want to stand and sing, you can do that as well. So let me pray. Father God, thank you for this time together this morning. And thank you for your love and your grace to us. And Father, I just pray that as we uh, continue to worship, that, Lord, if, if there's things in our lives, Lord, where there's unforgiveness, would you reveal that to us, Lord? And, and maybe right now the Spirit of God is putting upon our own hearts and minds somebody that we have in our sphere of influence to whom we need to go to and repent to, that we need to ask forgiveness uh, to. And, and Lord, w would you give us the courage and the boldness to do what's right, even though it's hard? And would you help us, Lord, to, to tell a better story to a world around us that desperately needs to hear a better story, a story of hope, a story of forgiveness, a story of love. And may we model that in our own lives by the way that we forgive others so that we can display how much we have been forgiven. So make us those kinds of people. Help us to tell a better story. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.